Dear church family, this morning we had the privilege of gathering together around the table of the Good Shepherd to eat uh, of the broken bread and drink of the poured out wine in remembrance of what he has done for, for sinners. And he was, he's reminded us that we are to do this often, to remember him regularly until he returns. Now, for the people of God, the the sacrament can be a time of incredible blessing, spiritual blessing, a time of sweet refreshment to the soul, where they've communed with their Lord and Savior. But it can also be, at times, you heard the voice of the shepherd calling you, you obeyed, you came, you remembered because of what he has done for you. You came out of obedience. You could not stay away, but maybe it was cold. It seemed distant. Maybe for others there was, it was a time of wrestling. The accuser was present, active, as, as, as you remembered attempting to raise doubts and struggles within, within the heart and mind and the soul. Or maybe you failed to come, even though you have come to see Jesus in his beauty, that he is the one who cleanses from all sin. Or maybe you were a young person who maybe a a teenager or a boy or a girl, and you love the Lord. You desire to serve him. But you you did not have the opportunity to come because you're not a a confessing member yet of this local church that you observe from from a distance. Regardless of where we were at as the people of God, Jesus remains the same for, for each of us, regardless of our, our particular situations. If you are washed, if you are cleansed in the blood of Christ, you are one of his sheep. And if you are one of his sheep, he will never leave or forsake you. For he is the good shepherd, the shepherd king who who promises to graciously care and continue to do that for his people. For he is our God, and we are his people. And and so with confidence, we can look forward, as the people of God, we can look forward to his continued provision, his uh, his continued rest. We can look forward to further restoration in times when we fail. We can look forward to comfort. We can look forward to his protection. We can look forward to everlasting fellowship. And this is what we hope to consider from this familiar psalm, Psalm 23, the, that, we, the, the, that we as the people of God can be confident, confident in the shepherd's continued grace and care. And we're going to do that by walking through, through this psalm together. Children, this is a very familiar psalm. Maybe you have even memorized it. And so I hope you can follow along too with us this, this afternoon. David begins this psalm with, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. This, this beginning line, this opening verse really becomes the the paradigm, the theme of this entire psalm. This is David's main point. Given who the Lord is, and notice Lord is in all capital letters here. This is Yahweh. The Yah- Yahweh is my shepherd. And this is a reference to the fact that our God is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God, and he establishes relationships with his people. He will keep them. David, given who the Lord is as his shepherd, 
He says, there is going to be absolutely no lack for me in this life and in the next. And David's going to illustrate this in five ways throughout the rest of the psalm. And we'll pick up each of them as we, as we come to them. But the, the, context, the concept of shepherding, of a, of a shepherd in the Old Testament, involves much more than one who is just taking care of sheep. This, the, when David says, the, the Lord is my shepherd, he is referring more also to the fact that the Lord is his king. He's ruling him, he's guiding him, he's, he's leading him. Kings often in the Old Testament were referred to as shepherds. Because they were there to care for their people, to lead them, protect them, supply for them in every way. This term shepherd spoke of, of the king's sovereign rule over the sheep, but also of his gracious rule, his care, his protection. And so here David is acknowledging that the Lord, his covenant God, is his shepherd king. He's the one who created him, but he's also his redeemer. He is the I am that I am, who's the one who's going to rule over his life. Now, shepherds and faithful kings were people who were fearless and, and absolutely courageous as they led and they protected, protected their people. We can think of David, children, you can think of David and the, the stories we've heard of how he, he slew the lion and the bear. Or, as he stood before Saul, his desire was to, to protect Israel from that giant Goliath. He wouldn't let the, the honor of the Lord be, be put into the dust. And so he went. He went before Goliath and slew him with the Lord's strength. And David says, this Lord... This God, who he delighted to serve and glorify, was his shepherd. And as David cared for sheep, so he, the Lord cares for his sheep. And he will do so tenderly and gently, but yet fearlessly and courageously. And dear people of God, your God continues to be that good shepherd for you on a daily basis. No matter what takes place in our lives, no matter what's going on, he remains the faithful shepherd to his people, to the flock as a whole, but also to each of us individually in our, in our daily lives. He knows, he knows you by name, and he calls out to you again and again to follow him, to follow, to follow his leading and guiding David, the Lord is not only my shepherd, but he is the one who, who continues to shepherd me. He never ceases in his act of care. As people of God, we are bought with his blood. But we continue to be a people who are in need of, of protection, care, because we are people who are, who are prone to go astray. Even after, even after experiencing God's mercy and grace and kindness, even in, in, in remembering his suffering and death as we, as we participated. How often don't we go astray? We're not a people that can survive on our own. We're by people who, uh, people who are restless and anxious, in need of convenient food from the word. People who are surrounded by challenges, on, on, on every front, difficulties, enemies. And so we need, we need him. And David, by faith, confesses that the Lord not is maybe my shepherd, not was my shepherd, the Lord is right now my shepherd. He is on my side. And therefore, he says, I shall not want. I shall not lack any good thing. Now, David, David isn't being naive. He knows 
of what unrest looks like. He knows of what trouble looks like. He knows what challenging situations look like. He knows in his own heart what it is to fall away and turn away from his Lord and commit sin and to, and to attempt to hide it. But he does place his trust, his confidence in the Lord and in his care. And David goes on to describe, and in the first place he's going to say, the shepherd, the shepherd provides rest, continued rest for the people of God. Now we may have experienced some measure of rest as we communed with the Lord this morning, but we're going to need ongoing rest. And David says there shall be no lack of rest because he says he's going to make me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. The picture here is, is a scene of quiet, of peace, a, a restful scene. Sheep free from the threat of danger, well supplied for, at peace from the troubles of this world. But the picture also suggests that by nature, sheep are, are restless. They're often skittish. They, sheep are an animal that tend to be very slow to lay down. Philip Keller, a, a shepherd who wrote a commentary on Psalm 23, says that sheep can and will only lie down when four different requirements have been met. There has to be, he says, a definite sense of freedom from four things. Freedom from fear, freedom from tension, freedom from aggravations, and freedom from hungry. And all four of these can only be provided for by the shepherd, he says. And this is what this text tells us. David says, the Lord as the good shepherd is the one who is going to make me to lie down in green pastures. David says, I cannot make myself lie down. The Lord has to make me to lie down. It's the shepherd alone who causes his sheep to lie down because he removes, the, he removes any enemies that might cause, up fear, that might cause fear. If there's tensions within the flock, it's the shepherd that's going to separate the sheep from one another. If, if there's aggravations of within, whether it's parasites or other things that are stirring up the flock, it's the shepherd that's going to have to care for them. The sheep cannot get them out themselves. If they're hungry, it's the shepherd who will have to bring them Two places where they will have plenty of food. It's a shepherd who causes his sheep to lie down. It has nothing to do with the sheep. It's nothing to do with you or me. But it has everything to do with our Lord and our Savior. For he is the one who removes the fears, the tensions, the aggravations, the hunger. And how does he do this? Well, Jesus has defeated the enemy. He's defeated Satan. He's, co he's conquered sin. He's conquered death and the grave. Things that can bring fear in, into the lives of the people of God. He does this by remaining close to his people. Never leaving them or forsaking them as he's promised in Hebrews 13. He calls out his sheep by name, drawing them to himself. He knows you, where you're at right now, today. He sent out a spirit to minister with our spirits, that we are the children of God. So that no matter what challenge you face, there can be peace, even in the midst of the storm. And the Lord's Supper, in many ways, can is like an oasis for the children of God, a time of respite in, in a busy, barren world around us. Was this morning like that for you? Were you able to commune and rest in the Lord Jesus Christ? Were you able to rest and lie down in, 
in a green pasture, free from fear, beside still waters, being replenished, were you able to commune with the shepherd? This word, he leads, refers to a gentle leading. It's like a, a father taking his child by the hand and leading him carefully, safely. It's the word that da- uh, Jacob uses, is used a, a, as Jacob led his flocks and his young children slowly and leisurely so that they would not be rushed or caused to faint in fear. Our good shepherd leads his people gently, leisurely, causing his tired, wearied, troubled sheep to lie down in green pastures. But he also restores. He restores, he provides provision of restoration. For by nature we as sheep, like sheep are prone to do, can often stray. There are often times of, even after times of sweet refreshment, there, there can be, we can be prone to be caught up in the things of this life leading us let it, causing us to let down our guard, thinking we can make it on our own. In verse 3, David draws our attention to this reality. He says, he restores my soul. He leads me into the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And the implication is that there is a need for restoration. The shepherd doesn't have to restore if they haven't went away. knowing that we are in so many ways like sheep who stubbornly go astray, thinking that there are better pastures or other water sources. Even after times of refreshing grace, we can stubbornly and foolishly try to find meaning and hope in our own ways, ideas, the world's thought patterns. We soon find ourselves away from the fold. David understood this. He knew what it was like to take matters into his own hands as he pretended to be insane before uh, Abimelech and, or where he indulged himself in a relationships that he wasn't called, that were, it, were not, that were sinful. He knew what it was like to cover his sin, pretending that things were good. But the Lord, as the good shepherd says, he restored my soul. He led him into paths of righteousness. And he did this for, the shepherd does this for his own glory, his own namesake. Now this word lead, he says, he he leads me in paths of righteousness. This is a a different word than we found in verse 2. The imagery found in this word lead is the idea he leads me into the well-worn wagon paths or trails in in the, the ruts that have been made by the old paths. It's suggesting that restoration and return will, will only occur when one returns to the good, well born paths of a life of obedience in Christ, set out by the standards that the Good Shepherd gives for his people to live, paths that conform to the image, his image, his image of righteousness. So dear children of God, know that as you go out this week, after a week of communion, that the Lord has his eyes on you. He knows you and when you stray, he will bring you back. He will restore. He will find you. But he desires that you keep close to him and walk in his paths of righteousness. But thirdly, not only does the shepherd provide places and times of sweet refreshment and rest, not only does he promise, give the promise of restoration when we stray, 
but he promises to continue to, to comfort his people, even in, in challenging and difficult times. Times of trouble, discouragement, will come if they haven't already. And David describes these difficult challenges as, as dark valleys, the valley of the shadow of death. Where the presence of enemies seems to be overwhelming. It, it maybe even seems for David at times that death was like inevitable. Trouble was on every side. Felt the world closing in on him. And David was intimately aware of these places. Yea, he says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He was aware of trouble. He was aware of dangerous situations. He was in them. But he also knew that his Lord, his shepherd, was there with him. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Thou art with me, David says. And so David is entering, he's in this, these valleys of the shadow of death, knowing that his shepherd is right there, right by him. His God was with him. Children, the, the picture of these valleys of the shadow of death, I want you to try to imagine. They're in one place, maybe a quiet scene, but they are heading to a maybe a mountain plateau where the, the, the sheep need to feed for the summer. And, but in between the, the valley and that mountain plateau, there is, there is ravines, there's, there's dangerous rushing rivers, there's overhanging ledges, it's dark, fearful predators lurking in the shadows. And they making their way up and maybe there's a mountain wall on one side and a ravine on the other side and one slip and the shepherd or the sheep is gone. But David is confident because his Lord is with him. The shepherd is right there talking with them as they're walking, as they're moving forward. The shepherd is leading, guiding calling out, calling a sheep to listen to his voice, to follow him. And doesn't he do that with us as we go through challenges in life? He's there in the midst of them. He's calling out to his sheep to hear him, to stay close to him. Whether it's through the preaching of the word, whether it's through other believers coming around, whether it's through our daily Bible reading, he's ministering to his own, calling them to trust him. David did, and we can too. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. The Lord is ever with his people leading them forward into the next green pasture, growing them, shaping them, molding them, and even through that trouble and trial, conforming them into the image of Christ. But maybe the question is, well, how does the Lord lead? How does the good shepherd lead his people through these dark valleys? Well, David then goes on to say, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. David here is referring to a single staff, not one, two different ones, but a single staff that had two ends on it. The one end was a club that was used to, to drive off the enemies, the dangerous predators that might be along the way. The other end of the staff was like a crook, uh, had a hook on it, where he could reach out and pull and bring back a, a wandering sheep. Both were serving, meant to be means to comfort and to care for the flock, to keep the sheep close to him. And the Lord our shepherd continues to exercise this rod and this staff by means of his word and his spirit. The word of God is given by the good shepherd to, to help us to ward off, the, to ward off enemies, the attacks of, of the enemy. 
and to keep us close to him. Didn't Jesus himself use this word as he, as he was being tempted by Satan? And he said to Satan, isn't it written? And he brings the very word of God back to Satan's temptation. And so we, we are to be people who are in this word, in this, in this scripture, studying it, reading it, knowing it, committing it to memory so that we can too apply that word in our times of trouble. A word that speaks into every area of our lives, whether it's our work life or our family life or our marriage or our personal life. But it's in this word that he also draws close to us and he comforts us. He pulls us back towards him as he ministers to us. It's how he speaks to us. So when the scriptures are open, whether on a Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, or whether around the dinner table as you do family devotions, or whether in your personal devotions or as you listen to a podcast on your way to work or from home, when you're working out at the gym, as you listen to the word, let it speak. Remember the shepherd is speaking to you. But the Lord also gives his spirit. And Paul actually refers to the word as being the word, the sword of the spirit. The spirit himself is indwells the people of God. And he's the one who blesses the word to our hearts and lives. He's the one that's going to be challenging us to put off sin and to put on Christ. He's going to encourage us in the promises of the scripture. He's going to be ministering with our spirit as we are the children of God. There are many, many of us we each have our own cares and needs, our own challenges, our own joys. There are many of us who are right now in the midst of walking a challenging way. You know your situation most perfectly. As a visiting pastor, I don't know all the ins and outs of this flock. But your good shepherd does. And he knows and he's promised to be with you, and you can with David say that I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Take comfort, brother or sister, knowing that you have a God who is with you and speaks into your situation with his perfect, perfect and suitable word. But not only does the shepherd comfort, he also provides, pl provides plenty, provision, and protection. David says this in our next verse, verse 5. Thou, as the good shepherd, preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runs over. The king, the shepherd king, is ensuring continued certain protection and plenty for his people. Come what may in this life, Christ is preparing a place for his people. Already now, he's preparing a, a heavenly mansions for his people in glory. And he's doing it in front of your enemies. Yes, the enemies of God, of the people of God are real. Satan, sin, our old man will and do raise their ugly heads again and again in an attempt to bring down the people of God. Satan despises it when, when the Lord, when the, when the gospel thrives and when the Lord communes with his people. He despises when Christ is made much of and we and we love him and serve him. And so, dear believer, know that you have a target on your back. 
as you've communed with him this week, know that Satan will love to get you to fall. But also know that your shepherd king is preparing a table, provision, protection for you in the presence of your enemy, Satan. He desires and delights and wants you to know that he wants to continue to commune with you even when Satan is raising up his accusations against you. Or when the world, too, attempts to draw you in, saying, conform to my standards. The world desires that you buy into its philosophies, its ways of thinking, into the, the, the confusion that is so prevalent in our day and age. The Lord is saying, I'm preparing a place for you where I will commune with you even in the midst of this world, in the midst of the enemies of this world. And even our old man, as it, as it raises its ugly head, sin, sins that you may have thought of and done away with can sometimes come back with a vengeance. Jesus is saying, I've prepared a place for you a table in the presence of your enemies. And he calls you to put off the old man and to put on him and to commune with him. We need to be vigilant. We need to remember that our shepherd king sees us as we go through that valley of the shadow of death, but he's also aware of our enemies he knows where they are at. He knows what their intentions are. He understands the challenges that they're going to, to raise. But he continues. He is preparing a place for his people. He will continue to equip, to provide for them, to protect, protect as they go through life. His grace and mercy come in waves. Psalm 136 gives that incredible picture of one grace and one mercy after another keep coming for every verse that in that psalm. For his mercy endures forever. For his mercy endures forever. For his mercy endures forever. But he calls us to use the means. The means of grace to frequent the house of God. To be, to be found in prayer, surrounding ourselves with the fellowship of other believers, to recognize the, the need for the anointing work of the Spirit in our lives, which we have at the end of the verse. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runs over. It refers to it's a picture of the empowering work of the Spirit in the lives of the children of God. As, the, as he pours out his spirit upon us. You've been equipped with the spirit. His presence. Now why does the, why does the good shepherd do this? What, what is his goal? Well, that in our last thought, as we come to the last verse, the desire of the shepherd is so that we would have everlasting communion and fellowship with him. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And not just all the days of my life, but I will then dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David concludes this psalm by confessing that the Lord's covenant faithfulness, his mercies, are going to follow him all the days of his life. They're going to per, the word follow there could be translated, shall pursue me all the days of my life. It's, you can't get away from the Lord's mercies and covenant faithfulness. They will pursue me all the days of my life. His, his kindness, his loyalty towards his people is unwavering. It pursues the people of God with intentionality and purpose. You cannot avoid his goodness and mercy when you are found in Christ Jesus. 
And so Paul, with knowing this, can say in Romans 8.28 that all things work together for the good of them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. They don't just pursue here and there, but David says, all the days of my life. Jesus Christ, as the good shepherd, is going to be showering his people with, with his presence, with his fellowship, with his provision, every moment of the way until they cross the Jordan and they enter glory to be with him. You will never be alone. And this is one of the reasons Christ calls us to remember his death often because he wants us to know that even in the Lord's Supper that he's pursuing his people. So every time we celebrate, we are reminded of his covenant faithfulness. We are reminded that he, he delights in fellowship with his people. And he's looking forward. The good shepherd is looking forward one day to commune with you forever, in his, with, with you in his presence, in glory. And this is what David concludes the psalm with. I will dwell. It's a future tense. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David is looking forward to a day where he will be in the Lord's presence forevermore. Unhindered fellowship, everlasting eternal fellowship with the good shepherd, with his savior, with Jesus Christ. Unhindered by sin, unhindered by weakness of body, unhindered by slowness of mind, unhindered by enemies, forever enjoying his presence in unhindered communion and fellowship, never desiring to stray from the, the green pastures, never discontent, never distracted, forever living in his presence, enjoying him forevermore, serving him unhindered, living for the entire purpose for which you and I were created, to glorify and to enjoy him forever. Friend, this morning at the Supper of the Lord, we have but just a foretaste of that eternal joy and glory that will be the people of God's. Do you long for an uninterrupted fellowship and joy in the presence of Jesus Christ? Or does... Or does this life, the here and now, is it too attractive? Does it call for your attention? Does it distract you? Or maybe, maybe you didn't even partake of the Lord's Supper. Maybe you don't know the Good Shepherd. He's not yours. Maybe you've never rested in his gracious and merciful care. Friend, if, if this is you, you are lost. You are, you are without a shepherd. And the antithesis of this psalm is really yours. You shall want. You shall not enjoy refreshing times in this busy, selfish world. You are walking down a winding path of sin that will lead to destruction. You should fear the troubles that you find yourself in. For the Lord is not with you. You do not have one to comfort you and to guide you. You are currently in the enemy's camp, witnessing the Lord's provision for his people. You are unprotected, without provision. You do not have the Lord's covenant mercies pursuing you all the days of your life. In fact, as Jesus says, my Father's wrath is abiding on you. And friend, if you do not repent, if you do not 
Turn to the Lord. Confess your sins and trust in this good shepherd. You will not dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But you will be under his everlasting punishment. Friend, if this is you, he calls out to you tonight to seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy and, he, and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. And in being pardoned, you get a good shepherd who will lead you. Friend, you're invited to come again once more yet this evening if you don't know the good shepherd. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Come and find rest for weary hearts in him. Amen. O faithful God and Father, Lord Jesus, we are thankful that thou art our good shepherd for thy dear people. We pray that as we go into this week, into the, into the months following the supper of our Lord, that we would continue to experience thy rest, thy protection and provision, thy bountiful supply. Pray that we would continue to experience thy restoration when we do fall. We're thankful, Lord Jesus, that thy mercies, thy covenant faithfulness pursues thy people all the days of their life. Lord, if there are, for those here who have never